morning, this Sunday morning. We are excited to be in your home this morning. We may not be present with you in body, but we sure are with you in spirit. Thank you all for responding last week online. I love reading your comments. I love seeing you. I saw many of you that were watching, and I just want to say thank you. We love you so much. We miss you, but we are in a new era. We are in a new time of our lives. We are in a new church. You know, we always say that the church is not the building. The church is you, and so today we still get to be the church wherever you are at, whether you're in Atlanta, because last week we had somebody in Atlanta. We had somebody in Minnesota. We had somebody was over uh, in Iowa that was watching our, our broadcast. And I just pray, God, that you will continue to be with all the church wherever you're at. We saw Dana, who was driving truck on the roads, pulled over the side at a truck stop, watching us from a truck stop there in, in some state. And I just want to say thank you for watching, being a part of our church. The church is not the building. The church is you. So thank you for for watching this Sunday morning. God bless you. Amen. I'm telling you, we are so excited because God is still doing great things. Do you believe God is still on the throne? Yes, he is. He's not left you. He's not forsake you. And let me tell you, there are so many exciting things. You've just got to look for the adventures right now. Make this time an adventure. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but since I've had this time, I've had an opportunity to be able to clean my garage. I'm telling you, I took out the leaf blower and I even blowed the floor and made the floor look like it was brand new. I don't know about you, but I'm finding ways not to go stir crazy. I'm finding ways that my wife is making me now clean the house. I did some dusting the other day, and I am not a duster. I don't like to dust. That's not my favorite part about cleaning the house, but I did it because I love my wife and I knew she needed help and I needed to do something. So there are ways that you can find to uh, keep yourself from going crazy. Maybe spend some time maybe reading to your spouses or your kids or whatever. But I don't know about you, I love to read. And I've always had a cliche to say that if you want to be a leader, you got to be a reader. And so I got to be a leader and so I need to be a reader. And so I'm taking time to read and I love reading books. And a lot of times when I read books, it's just books to feed feed me, not necessarily to feed you, but just to feed my spirit and to uplift me. So I want to encourage you, find a good book, find a, a cup of tea for me like I always do, and find a place that you can just get along with you and God and get revitalized, get rejuvenated with the things of God. Hey man, I've been talking about this series about the power of one, and last week we talked about the power to serve one another. Well, let me tell you a testimony about a young man who got a phone call from a lady that said, hey, I need some help with my computer. And this young man was trying to describe things across the phone about how to make her computer system come together. Well, she was unable to figure it out, so he said, let me just come over your house and help you set up your computer and make it run. Well, this young man jumped in his car and drove over to the lady's house where she needed her computer fixed. It took him over three hours to be able to get her computer system to run the way she needed it to run. And after he got done uh, doing the job and doing the work for her, she asked to pay him, and he said, no, this is part of being the church. I've come to serve you. i come to help you. i come to just be a part of the church by giving my time to you. That's what serving is all about. And I want to encourage you, continue to serve one another, continue to love one another. But as I, we talked about serving last week, last week we talked about our greatest joy comes from loving Jesus and serving others. You see, when you fall in love with Jesus, you can't help but want to serve others because Jesus was the ultimate server. He served one another. He served man. He gave up his life not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom. I love this. When God wants to bring Christ into the world, he looks for servants. Servants are you and I. And I want to encourage you. Last week I gave you a list of things that you can do to help serve one another. I understand this week it's going to be a great opportunity to be warm tomorrow. It's supposed to be up into the 50s on Monday. And I'm excited about that, that maybe I can finally get some of my leaves cleaned up. And so I don't know about you, but maybe we can serve one another around the yard with people and, and take out our leaf blowers and help clean up yards with people, whatever it may be to serve. And serving others for the Lord's sake stores up treasures in heaven and makes the angels rejoice. So we talked about that last week and about how it stores up treasures 
here not on earth, but here in heaven, where God sees what we do for one another and how we serve one another. I was going to end this series today, but because Easter is coming up in two weeks, I thought I'd go and preach next week. Next Sunday will be the last part of the power of one. And so we're going to finish out this series by Easter time. And Easter time, we have something very special for you that we're getting ready to do for you as a church. And I want to encourage you, look for something at Easter time, whether it be on a Friday or Saturday, something that we as a staff are going to place at your doorstep step. And so when you open what you get, please follow the instructions of what we put at your doorstep so we as a church can do it all together. And so that will be coming up to you next Sunday. I will tell you more details, but I want to just give you a teaser about what we're doing for Easter as a church. So look for something a couple days before Easter of what we're getting ready to do. But today, I thought when I wrote this sermon about something that we need very special right now, especially that we're all cooped up together. Maybe we're losing our patience with one another. I know that parents are having to stay home now from work, and you're cooped up in the place with your kids, and the patients are running thin. But I want to talk to you today about the power of one in encouragement, encouraging one another to be an encouraging to one another during this time. We are going through a tough time, but this is not a time to put down, but a time to build up. I love what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. He talks about the power of one of encouragement, and he reads these words. Therefore, encourage, encourage one another, and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. So right now, during these hard times of our lives right now, we need to encourage one another. Encourage means to inspire. To uh, Encourage means to lift up or to build up, to talk good about someone or somebody. That's what encouraging is, to give praise where praise is due, to let someone know how much you appreciate all what they're doing, for young people to let your mom and dad know the sacrifices that they're making for you, to encourage them, thank you, mom and dad, for what you are doing for me. And also, m parents, make sure that you encourage your kids, that you let them know how much you love and appreciate them. When I was growing up, I would always go to the farm on my grandpa's place. And my grandpa, man, he was my hero. As many of you know that I didn't have a, really a father figure in my life. Man, my fathers would blow in and blow out because I had three different fathers. And the father image that I saw with my fathers weren't that great of an image. But my grandfather was my hero. And the reason he was my hero was because he taught me the things of life. And one of the things that I loved about my grandfather that made me feel so special is that my grandfather would encourage me. Man, I would get around my grandfather and being on the farm, it's kind of like what I feel like right now. Man, it was just me, my grandmother, and my grandpa that were the three of us on the farm. And man, 24-7 being on the farm, believe me you, it's kind of like the feeling we are now. I was always cooped up. There was nothing to do. I remember I would take a rubber ball and just throw it against the side of the building with my glove on, act like I was playing catch with myself. I would make up things to do during this time of being on the farm. But I loved being around my grandfather because of one thing. My grandfather was the biggest encourager. Man, every time I got around my grandfather, man, he would make me feel like I was Superman. He would make me feel like I was just the, the greatest thing, that I could do anything that I put my hands to doing because he would encourage me. He would always call me son. He wouldn't call me CJ or Craig. He would say, son, if you believe in these things, you can do them. He would encourage me. I would remember many times as we were walking in the field getting the cows or checking on the oats and shocking them and so on, that, all the things that we had to do. He would put his arm around me. He said, son, I just want you to know how proud of you I am and how I love you and how I appreciate you. And every time he would do that, it would make me feel like, man, I'm invincible. And that's what encouragement is all about. Look for opportunities to encourage each other during this time. The pressures are hard, granted. But also, if you have your notes, and they're also going to be on the line, you can see them. With hard times today in our world, it's not a time to put down, but a time to build up. 
You see, it's easy to tear down. You see, you don't build a house overnight, but you can tear down a house in one day. It's the same way. It's not easy to build up sometimes, but you build up by words of encouraging, by encouraging one another, telling each other that you love one another, that you appreciate each other. Even the small little things that people do around you now is a time to encourage and thank them for what they're doing. You see, I can tear down someone in a moment, but it's harder to build up. And I want to encourage you, learn to build up at this time. We need to make a conscious effort to encourage each other during this time, to make a conscious effort. I'm going to do my best to look for the positive things that people are doing in my life. Look for the positive things that my kids are doing. Maybe my daughter or my son washed the dishes and they normally never do that. Make sure that you encourage them, that you thank them, that you let them know how much you appreciate them. Kids also, make sure that you encourage your mom and dad for all what they do for you, for the sacrifices they make. They have to go maybe on their job and be amongst people that could possibly have this virus, and yet they're they're willing to make the sacrifice for you to put bread on the table so that you can be fed each day. I want to encourage you on, to encourage each other. You see, the Bible says in Proverbs 18, 21, I love what he says. The Bible says in Psalms, uh, Proverbs, he says this, and Solomon was the wisest man on the planet. And he gives us these words, and he says this, the tongue, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And so the p tongue has the power of life and death. James says that your tongue is like a, a vessel or, a, or a, 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 on, on the ship that you can turn the ship with your tongue because your tongue has life in death. And if you ever thought about that, you will eat the fruit there of it. And so what kind of fruit are you producing? You see, if you look at fruit, many of you will not like to eat rotten fruit. I don't know about you, but when bananas get brown and so on, some of you like them brown. But for me, I don't like them that soft and mushy, but other people do. But fruit is what you bear. And so I want to encourage you, what kind of fruit are you producing? Are you producing good fruit in, in those around you? And you do that by your words, words of encouragement, words of edification, of letting people know how much you appreciate them. Are you speaking life? or death. The choice is yours. No one else's. You have a choice. I used to remember watching a comedian. His name was Flip Wilson. And Flip Wilson always would say the line, the devil made me do it. In other words, he made excuses for what he did or even what he said. And so, so many times we make excuses for what we say. And I want to encourage you, make a conscious effort to uplift, to build up people during this time. Because if you're always tearing down, it's going to make the situation around you worse. I don't know about you, but if you have a cat, I used to have a cat, but not no more. My wife is definitely afraid of a cat. But when you take a cat and it crawls up in your lap and you begin to pet that cat, all of a sudden, what does that cat begin to do? It begins to purr. All of a sudden, it falls asleep. And if you had a cat like I had, that cat even not only purred, but it also snored. It was the funniest cat, the one that I had growing up as a kid. But the point of that is when I would pet it, when I would caress that cat, and when it would snuggle up to me, it felt so safe. It felt encouraged. It felt, man, that it can be relaxed. That's what it's all about with words of encouragement. You want to let your kids know that you love them. You want to build them up. You want to build your spouse up. You want to build one another up so that they will purr and be happy in this time of crisis. During this time of crisis, we need to be life givers. Be life givers by the words of encouragement that I'm going to give life. I'm going to Speak life into that situation. I'm not going to be a part of the problem. I'm going to be part of the solution to the problem. And I know that there's hard times, and we can all sit around the table and complain and murmur about what is happening and what is going on right now. But I want to encourage you, be the part of the solution to the problem. Man, bring encouragement to the situation. I love what Hallmark is doing. I thought it's kind of funny that my wife, I walked up into the bedroom last night, and my wife had Hallmark on. And I walked in at the very moment when it said Merry Christmas. 
And I'm thinking, Merry Christmas. And I asked my wife, why in the world are they playing Christmas Hallmark movies now? And she said, because people get encouraged by these movies. And I thought, wow, how crazy that is. Merry Christmas. I'm watching the snow melt and not come back. I want to go on in life and have the summer. But those movies supposedly encourage people. Think about how you can encourage others. The words you speak have the power to affect others' joy, their mood, and their future. So are you affecting the mood around people right now? Are you being a naysayer instead of one that's building people up? Are you one that's tearing down instead of building up? You see, you set the tone in your household. You as parents, you set the tone. Your kids will follow you. You set the tone of how you act and what you say. If you want to have a happy home, then you have to lead by being happy, by being that example. You have to be the one that leads the charge of encouragement, by being the one that's leading the charge of encouraging one another, lifting one another up, and letting each other know how much you appreciate them. What you sow is what you reap. If you are always sowing negative things, guess what's going to come back to you? Negative things. If you're sowing positive things, guess what's going to come back to you? Positive things. I always told my kids when they were growing up, I'm going to put deposits in your life right now. Watching you grow up till you get 18 and move out of the house and go to college, I'm going to deposit in you all that I can as a father, as an example to you, as a mentor to you. I'm going to give all I can to you. I sacrifice, Cheryl sacrificed to buy them tennis shoes and to buy them the clothes that they needed to go to school with. I sacrifice and I deposit in their life. And guess what? What I deposit in their life, I'm now starting to reap back, Cheryl and I, from our kids. They're able to buy me clothes. They're able to take me out to eat. They're able to do things for me and Cheryl now that they never were able to do before they were 18. You see, the principle is what you sow is what you're going to reap. So are you sowing words of edification? Are you sowing words of encouragement? Or are you a naysayer? Are you killing someone's dream? You see, your words can prophesy your future and those around you. So watch what you say. You saw that old commercial by Toyota. Toyota used to have a commercial that says, you asked for it, you got it, Toyota. What you say is what you're going to reap. So you ask for it. What are you prophesying into your future? You call those things as though they were. So if you're calling in the negative things, that's what's going to come your way. You're prophesying your future. Romans chapter 15, verse 4 says these words. He says, for everything that was written in the past, in the past, was what? Written to teach us today. So everything that was written in the past was written for us to teach us today, right now, this present moment, this Sunday morning, so that through the endurance taught by the Scriptures, by the Scriptures, the Holy Bible, the way, the truth, and the life, the, the Bible says the truth will set you free. The truth, he says this, is taught by the Scriptures, and it's what he says, and the encouragement that they provide that we might have hope. How ironic that is that Paul wrote that verse, or that chapter of Romans 15, verse 4, it's saying that what was written back then is for our encouragement today and for our hope for the future. But when you think about that, what do you mean by that? What are the words of encouragement that we will have hope today? Number one is this. We will get through this time we are in. That's a word of encouragement. We will get through this. Another one is this. What is this hope or encouragement? That God will provide during this time. Right. That God will provide. That is the hope of encouragement. Another one is this. What is this hope of encouragement? That the church will become stronger during this time. It's not a time to scatter, but it's time to be united, that we will become stronger, that we will become the power of one. That is the hope that we have, that God will provide, that we will get through this, that the church will get stronger. Then it goes on to say in Romans 15, verse 5, I love this next verse that Paul writes. Right after verse 4 of saying about encouragement, he comes along with verse 5. And what he says, may the God 
who gives endurance, encouragement, give you, give you. That's you and I. Make it plural. He's talking to you today, not the person on the, the, to the right or to the left of you. He's talking to you. He says, give encouragement to the same attitude or mindset towards each other that Christ Jesus had. So he said, I love this. And the encouragement give you the same attitude. Everything starts with an attitude. Your attitude determines your altitude, how high you will go in life. If you have a negative, stinking, thinking attitude, a complaining attitude, always putting each other down and all these things, guess what? You're going to be flying low. But if you have an attitude of gratitude, it's going to lift you up and not only lift you up, but the others around you. The others around you. So I want to encourage you. God is for you. Here is the encouragement that God has for you. That God is for you. He believes in you. He encourages you to encourage others. Man, that's exciting. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And what is that spirit? That spirit of encouragement, that spirit of love, that spirit of acceptance, that spirit of forgiveness towards one another, being patient and enduring each other during this time, that I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to lift up your arms. And as we lift each other's arms up, we're going to win this battle, and we will get through this. Let me encourage you with that. You see, words of encouragement make the weak feel strong and the unworthy feel worthy. Man, in our weakness, he's made strong, but he becomes strong in your life by the words of edification that you will get through this, that God loves you, that he's not forsaken you or given up on you. Those are words of encouragement that you can give to your brother and your sister. I love this. Your words resuscitate life to your family and hope to the hopeless. Maybe some of you need to resuscitate your family right now. Maybe they're, you're feeling dead. Maybe you're feeling discouraged. Maybe you're feeling depressed. Maybe it's you that takes the lead right now to resuscitate life into your family. It only takes a spark to get a fire going, and it only takes a word of encouragement that can change the course or alter your situation in life right now. I want to encourage you, take the lead in that situation. I read a story the other day about the Dr. John Gottman. Dr. John Doc Gottman identified an interesting characteristic of a happy couple. Of a happy couple, he identified that. He says this, healthy homes enjoy a positive uh, to negative ratio by five to one. He said, this is how you do it. Now watch this. I thought this, and this is on the screen. That you can get this off your notes. Now watch what John Gottman says. He says, for every negative comment or criticism, there needs to be five acts of words of encouragement. Wow. In other words, why is that? Five acts of encouragement compared to one negative comment. Because one negative comment can bring down and destroy. Just like I said, you don't build a house overnight, but you can tear it down in one day. And five words of encouragement, what? Can evaporate the negative things in someone's life. Be an encourager. Be an uplifter. Be a cheerleader to someone in your life. I love this. One study of identified leadership styles revealed that the high-performing teams experienced a, ne a positive to negative ratio for nearly six positive comments for every negative one. Man, six positive high-performing leadership styles or companies performing highly were six to one in the ratio of giving encouragement. How about you today? Who do you need to encourage? Husband and wives, do you need to encourage each other? It's not a time to fight against each other. It's not a time to point fingers and say it's your fault, his fault, your fault, that fault, kids' fault. It's nobody's fault. What we're in right now, we can't control. What we're in right now, it's what we have had made happen. It's out of our control. And so because it's out of our control, what you can control is your attitude. 
What you can control is what you say to one another. What you can control is your tongue because your tongue has power in life and death. And I want to encourage you, speak life. Now watch this. Low-performing teams conversely had an average of three negative comments to every one. Wow. Three negative comments made it what low-performing teams would happen. And you wonder sometimes maybe why your kids are performing low, and maybe they're not producing like you maybe want them to, or maybe your spouse is not producing or he or she is not doing what you expect them to do. Maybe you have beat them down. Maybe you have destroyed their confidence. Maybe you have broken their heart that they have no life in them anymore. You can take a balloon that is deflated, and man, when you buy a balloon, it's totally deflated. But all it takes is one, just one breath, and it all of a sudden starts to expand that balloon. And sooner or later, as you put more air into that balloon, that balloon begins to become what it's supposed to be. It becomes a full balloon. It doesn't look wrinkled, fragile, dead, or no life. But there's life blowing into that balloon because why? I chose to blow it in there. Maybe you need to speak life into your spouse right now. Maybe you need to speak life into your kids. Kids, maybe you need to speak life to your mom and dad. That's what encouragement is. It takes a balloon that has lifeless, no air in it, and the moment you blow one breath of air, it begins to expand. Expand it. It begins to blow it up. You need to be that life. You need to be that life. When my, my wife, she always started something when our kids were growing up. And my kids would always think it was funny. But my wife would always listen to my kids. And we, we travel. We'd have to travel from Colorado to Wisconsin to Racine, Wisconsin, or Colorado to Minneapolis. And those trips were long. Sometimes they were 23 to 24 hours one way to get to Wisconsin or Minnesota. And we had a van, so it was comfortable for our kids to be able to move around. And we had one of those conversion vans, and it had a TV and a VCR in it. And it was nice. We could even convert the back of the van into a bed. So the kids weren't really in cramped space, and they could do whatever they want and watch TV. But yet, being in a car together, man, sometimes there was these quarreling times. And our kids would begin to put each other down. They would put each other down and, Heidi, you're this, and CJ, you're that, and Rick, you're that. And my wife would catch ear of that. And the moment she caught ear of that, she would say, Rick, you just put Heidi down. And you said something negative to Heidi. Or CJ, you said something negative to Rick. And you need to right now stop and say ten good things about each other. Mom, I don't want to do that. And my wife was insistent, Rick, you say 10 good things to Heidi. CJ, you say 10 good things to Rick. And I kid you not, it never seemed to fail. They would start going down the list. Oh, Heidi, you're pretty. Oh, Rick, you're funny. And they would go back and forth, and they would say 10 good things. By the time they got to five good things about each other, they would start laughing. And their attitude and their mood would change. What happened was because they got rid of the stinking thinking, the negative attitude towards one another, and they started encouraging each other. And they looked through the lens of their eyes in a different way. And sometimes what you need to do is look through your eyes in a different way. Don't look for the negative things. Look and expound on the positive things. And not only expound on them, but when you see the positive things, let the people know around you what good they've done. That's a word of encouragement. You see, listen, people have a way of becoming. People have a way of becoming what you encourage them to be. You see, not what you nag them to be. Let me read that again so that you get this in your heart. People have a way of becoming what you encourage them to be. Just like my grandfather, he made me feel like Superman. He encouraged me to be the man that I am today. But look at this, not what you nag them to be. Not what you nag them to be. You should be this and you should be that. You see, all that does, it puts down and destroys. 
You see, there was a milk truck that drove by these two cows. They were grazing in the field. And this milk truck drove by these two cows. And one of the cows happens to glance at the milk truck. And on the side of the milk truck, it read, pasteurize, standardize, homogenize, vitamin A added. And the cows read that. And one of the cows turned to the other cow and said, hey, man, by reading that, it makes me feel inadequate. And so many times in life, we're reading the billboard about somebody who maybe is not that. And I want to encourage you to lift each other up. In Hebrews chapter 10, I love this verse of Scripture. He says, and let us consider, and let us consider how we may spur one another on. In other words, encourage, ignite, inspire one another on towards love and good deeds. You see, the Bible is saying that we need to encourage one another on, inspire them, inspire them to be able to dream. My wife and I, since we've been caught up in the house, and I only have done this maybe one other time, and that was when it first started, but we're into watching American Idol, and maybe you are too. But I love what some of the judges are saying. I love the sensitivity of Katy Perry, uh, how she's crying some, during some of the performances. And just this last one, one of the girls passed out because she got so stressed out that she had to go to the hospital. But she was able to come back and do her audition and do her solo. And it was so cool that after she got done doing her solo, Katy Perry made it a point to let her know how proud she was of her and how she encouraged her to continue on in her dream. And you know what happened? That girl made it on to the next level. Why? Because she inspired. Katy Perry inspired this girl. Who can you inspire to bring them to the next level in their life in their life of who they're supposed to be. Your words prophesy their future. Why don't you prophesy good things today? You see, listen, I love what it says. The verb means consider. The verb consider means to perceive clearly. To perceive clearly. Watch this. Understand fully and consider closely. In other, other words, it's saying perceive clearly about maybe the person's circumstances. Don't be so quick to tear down, but be so more lift uh, 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 the ability to uplift, uplift to encourage each other. I had the opportunity this last year while coaching basketball for Siren High School, and I was just the assistant coach, but there was a young man on the team that his goal was to score a thousand points for his career. He was a senior. Man, I love this kid. The kid all had all kinds of talent. And we were down to two last games, and he was 47 points shy of scoring 1,000 points. And I'll tell you, I, I loved the head coach, Coach Rick. Coach Rick knew that Riley needed 47 points to score 1,000 points. So the, the second game to the end, the he let Riley stay in the game, and we beat this team pretty handily. But he kept Riley in the game because he believed in Riley, and he was encouraging Riley to get closer to his 1,000 points. And Riley is not a selfish player, but the coach had to, from the sideline, tell Riley, Riley, shoot the ball! Shoot the ball! So Riley, that game, he scored 32 points, which left him for the last game of the season – of 15 points he needed to score before he got his 1,000 points. And I'll never forget, man, we had shirts made up, and my, my wife and I brought our shirts, and they're green, and it says on the front, 1,000-point uh, career. On the back it says Church Hill. And, man, it looked like a jersey, but it was a, a T-shirt. And all of a sudden we're playing this away game, and the away game is two and a half hours away. And I mean to tell you, People loaded up buses to come and watch this last game to see if Riley could score 1,000 points. So Riley needed 15 points to score to get 1,000 points. Here it was. He had 14 points, 
14 points, one point shy of scoring 1,000 points. Well, not only did we know that Riley had now 999 points, one point shy of scoring 1,000 points. It looked like it was impossible for him to do that. There was 3.5 seconds left on the clock. We had the ball. And the coach on the other team calls a timeout. He calls a timeout, and he gets his team together, not to strategize to, to run a play, because they're already winning by 14 points. But he calls a timeout knowing that Riley had 999 points left and one shy. We had the ball with 3.5 seconds left. We take the ball out, and the coach on our team says, pass the ball to Riley. But what the other team's coach was doing, he said to his players, when Riley gets the ball, I want you to intentionally foul him. In other words, we were in a bonus that allowed Riley with 3.5 seconds to go, to go and score. So he goes to the free throw line. And everyone is standing. The crowd now knows that Riley is one point shy of scoring 1,000 points. All he has to do is make one free throw. But the one free throw that he had to make was the first one in order for him to shoot the second one. On the one and one. He gets to the free throw line. The players are there. And not only did the coaches know and the fans knew, but also the ref knew that Riley needed one more point. Riley gets to the free throw line. We're all excited. We're ready to burst open our shirts like Superman and show our S. But in other words, our thousand point Riley. We're ready to celebrate and cheer. The stands are full. People are standing to their feet waiting with expectation for Riley to score this point. He gets to the line. Man, he does his normal routine. He dribbles the ball about five times and he sets his feet and and all of a sudden, he shoots, and he misses, which would have caused him to not make his 1,000 points because the other team got the rebound. But all of a sudden, the ref knew that he needed one more point. So this ref, out of the sky blue, no one set him up, called the violation on the other team. Because he called that violation, it allowed Riley to once again shoot. Everybody in the stands, to the ref, to the coaches, to the players, were all encouraging Riley. So Riley got an opportunity again to shoot. One point shy of scoring 1,000 points. He, this time he gets to the line, he goes through his routine again. Dribbles the ball five times, sets its feet, shoots the ball, and swish. Riley made the basket. The place erupted. People started taking off their shirts and showing the green shirt underneath their shirt. And Man, the crowd was going crazy, and people were high-fiving one another. Riley's at the free throw line knowing now he accomplished his goal. He's trying, and now he had to shoot one more free throw, and he couldn't do it. He shot the free throw, and he missed. And for Riley's career, he scored exactly 1,000 points. The point of that story is Riley scored because every one of us had a part of encouraging him. That's what it's all about, encouraging one another, looking beyond a person's faults and seeing the good in them, finding the diamond in the rough, during this time and bringing out the shine in the luster of that diamond. I love this. Let's make happiness happen. Let's encourage one another. Listen to me now. Call someone mighty. Call someone special. Call someone rocky. And the reason why that came to me, because I was Rocky watching Rocky II the other day. Call someone Rocky. Dun, 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 dun. Give the gift that God loves to give. The gift of encouragement. 
And as your pastor today, I want to encourage you. Give the gift of encouragement. Put your arm around somebody. Let them know how much you love them. As we close, I want to pray for you. But before I pray for you, I know that there's a lot of fear and a lot of things going on in people's lives. But the Bible says, perfect love casts out all fear. That's right. That's right. And I want to encourage you. There may be those that are watching right now that maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he gives you hope. He gives you peace. He gives you comfort during this time. But that's why you can say that perfect love casts out all fear. Why? Because Jesus is the perfect lover. And he takes away all fear. So before we go any further, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to pray with you right now, wherever you're at. If you're listening right now in your living room or even on a laptop somewhere, like Dana listening in his truck, in a truck stop, I want to encourage you right now to pray this prayer with me, if you would. Heavenly Father, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my rounds, my faults, and my failures. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you become the Lord and Savior of my life. I repent, Lord God, today. I accept you in. Make me new, as you say in your word. I thank you, Father, for the newfound peace, joy, contentment, and strength that comes from you. We give you praise and we give you glory. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I wanted to say one of the things as Pastor was preaching, one of the things that he was talking about when he was talking and sharing the story about Riley, we watched Riley all year where he could have made those thousand points a long time ago. But I can tell you one of the reasons why he didn't, because he played so unselfishly. He was such a team player. He was always making sure, instead of being selfish and taking every throw or every shot, he was constantly passing off, looking for where the best shot would be for somebody else. And I'm telling you, we are a team. We as a church are a team. And we just appreciate each and every one of you. And so as pastor was encouraging you to encourage one another, encourage him as a teammate. Encourage them because we are one team. Amen. Amen. As we close, stretch out your hand now. Let me pray with you. Yes. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up Adventure Church and all the listeners right now. Yes. Father, I know that we may not be present in body, but we are in spirit. Yes. And you say where two or three agree, it shall be done. There's power in agreement. Father, your Holy Spirit is omnipresent, it is everywhere. And I speak it into the households right now in the name of Jesus. That you will touch and heal and provide and guide and give hope to the hopeless right now in Jesus' name. Let the joy of the Lord be their strength today. Let us not look at what we don't have, but let's look at what we do have. And what we first and foremost have is you on Christ the solid rock. We will stand. This church will not be shaken. We are walking in the spirit and the power of your mind, knowing that the church will go forward because if God is for us, who can be against us? So, Father, thank you for every household. Bless them, Lord. Encourage them now. And we thank you for this wonderful Sunday and what you're doing. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you in Jesus' name. Until next week, love you. I want to see you.